Good evening. I'm still thinking about what the joke is supposed to be. You know about the three women sitting on the park bench, and the first one goes, and the second one goes, and the third one goes, and then the first one says, we weren't going to talk about our children. I'm thinking of that one a lot of when I read the news. But anyway, um, <laughs> being in this company is such an honor. The company and the project of the Academy honor and inspire me. The founders launched a project that has never been more needed. So many now yearn for thoughtful and practical policymaking informed by rigorous thinking and knowledge. Indeed. Many now yearn to find people who desire facts and reason. I am unequivocally honored to be welcomed here as a fellow. The association's purposes and its membership represent the highest values of truth-seeking for the civic good. I'm intrigued, but a little more mixed with the association with Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> now, of course, I admire his zest his crusades against governmental corruption, his commitment to what he called a square deal, which he said meant not only fair play under the present rules of the game, but also changing the rules to work for a more substantial equality of opportunity and of reward for equally good service. Those are his words. He convened the first White House conference for the care of dependent children, but, but, but. He also viewed American Indians, and I quote, as savages to be conquered. He welcomed immigrants if they Americanized in a particular way. He supported rights for children, but failed to see women as equal to men. He described himself as, again, quote, rather tepidly in favor of women's suffrage. Whether uh, forced to take sides, he supported it, but he really thought that women ought to decide among themselves and he also emphasized that the issue of women's voting was not, and again I quote, a th thousandth or a millionth part as important as the realization that their great work must be done in the home. He was a conservationist, that's great. But he was also a big game hunter and a lifetime member of the National Rifle Association. He and his companions killed or trapped approximately 11,400 animals on one trip. I am a vegetarian. <laughs> While running as third party candidate for president in 1912, former President Roosevelt decided to seat the all white delegation from the South rather than the rival black delegations as they arrived at the conventions. In foreign policy, he was an imperialist he called other nations uncivilized. In sum, he reflected and enacted views about human differences, no doubt common in his time, but used still to this day much too long as reasons to treat people worse simply on the grounds that they are, quote, different, at least seen to be different by those with power. The use of public and private power to subjugate individuals on grounds of differences named and perceived by those with authority, this has occupied my work as a scholar and advocate, maybe because I'm a middle child. I'm not sure. <laughs> now, addressing exclusions based on race, gender, disability, language, religion, I've asked, when does treating people differently emphasize their differences and stigmatize or hinder them on that basis? And when does treating people the same become insensitive to their differences and stigmatize or hinder on that basis? A world that makes perceived differences among people matter for status, opportunity, and rights is a world creating a dilemma for any reformer. That dilemma reflects assumptions and practices, assumptions and practices we can change about what we take as given about our physical and social environment. In designing schools and jobs and buildings and families, we face entrenched exclusions and new problems with reforms. Affirmative action, special education for disabled persons, well, who's a family, 
each of these actually poses problems for those that the reforms are meant to benefit. Even more horrifyingly, differences supply the excuse for hatreds, demonizations, detentions, and mass killings. Earlier this week, I was indeed in Argentina. I visited the building that was used not that long ago as a detention center and concentration camp located right in the center of the city where forensic anthropologists and lawyers today continue to piece together why and how the military regime targeted students, political dissidents, Jews, and journalists. Social scientists trace what produces and what follows from mass atrocities targeting people based on their religions and ethnicities and nationalities, professions, or other traits. The work of social scientists and advocates is crucial to devising responses to violence, to mass violence, if there's any hope of reducing rather than increasing the predicates for new rounds of hatred and violence. Do criminal trials, reparations, truth commissions offer individuals and societies help in moving beyond revenge and forging stability and respect for human dignity? When does a response to the past injustice create a new round of resentments? What political and legal arrangements help? These are the kinds of questions that occupy me. Now, paradoxical as it may be, the one universal truth I have found is it depends. That's what I tell law students the first day of school, right answer always to say it depends. But it turns out that context matters, local values, the kinds of participation that are actually available, people's experiences, the stories they tell themselves and their children, these matter. Yet to say so is not to shun general lodestars, overcome secrecy and denial, increase participatory processes, cultivate respect and genuine opportunities for each and every individual. These elements matter as individuals and societies come to grips with mass atrocities, exclusions from education, and other degradations based on identity, and work on how people see their connections with one another, and not just their socially constructed differences. Humbling to see reforms themselves become the problem, that's another subject of my work. Backlash, backtracking in the face of reforms, backlash against human rights was the focus of a huge conference last year in Vienna. Many of us have lived through backlash against school desegregation, against bilingual education, and there are end runs around reforms. Think circumvention of public accountability for governmental uses of torture. Why? Because it was outsourced. Look at reforms of reforms, resegregating schools along lines of race and class. These and other failures have prompted me to spend time studying, something I never thought I would, outsourcing and the ground rules of public and private power. I worry about substituting commercial private interests for public institutions in schools and prisons and police and war fighting. And yet having public and private spheres, having pluralism in our institutional arrangements as well as among our people, this is invaluable. It was Amazon and Airbnb that have provided vivid resistance to anti-immigrant rhetoric in America. At this strange and disturbing time in this country and in the world, I join others with gratitude for the speed bumps built into our legal and political systems. These include preservations of the spheres of difference between public and private power, separation of powers, federalism, power to check power, and political structures founded on debate, and indeed on the ambitions of competing people. Today and every day, I am grateful to the truth seekers, to social scientists, to journalists, and others who inform and who teach. I'm not a social scientist. I'm a fellow traveler. And I am so grateful to the people who have patiently taught me about significance levels and other kinds of important uh, categories and classifications and analyses, whether at the Russell Sage Foundation or the W2 Grant Foundation or the Social Science Research Council, I have learned a great deal. And here, I do admire Theodore Roosevelt. Can't believe it. 
But the writer and the reader, he voraciously read at least one book a day. Just as I admire the members of this organization who search for truth, reason, and the public good, that offers crucial hope for the future. Thanks very much.